Well, thank you, Emmanuel, and uh, thank you for the invitation and the honor of being able to present this work at the Collège de France. It's a great pleasure to be here with um, so many esteemed colleagues and so many names that I've known about and seen on papers over the years and uh, respect to a great degree. So I should say I'm presenting this on behalf of the National Plant Monitoring Scheme Partnership as well, and the UK Centre for College in Hydrology is only one of those partners. Um, I've been lazy and not included all the logos here, but organisations that you may have heard of, such as the Botanical Society for Britain and Ireland, uh, the plant conservation charity Plant Life, uh, and one of our government arms length conservation bodies, the Joint Nature Conservation Committee, also key partners in the National Plant Monitoring Scheme. So this work um, represents the efforts of, of many people and, and many structures uh, in the UK. So, um, uh, yeah, here we go. Um, I will say, though, that myself within the UK CEH, I'm mainly based within something called the Biological Records Centre, and that's relevant for this talk because the National Plant Monitoring Scheme is a citizen science monitoring scheme in that we work with amateur naturalists across the UK to record these data. And that is the tradition of this structure. The Biological Records Centre was founded back in 1962 as a result of the first plant distribution atlas for Britain and Ireland um, which was ultimately published, I think, in 1964. Uh, and that was the first such plant distribution atlas using a grid that I believe was published anywhere in the world. And you're, I'm sure you're all very familiar with the type of dot distribution atlas maps that that type of effort has produced. Um, the Biological Record Centre, however, don't just work with plants. We, we work across the, the taxonomic spectrum. Um, this is a, you may not be able to see all the detail here, but this is a phylogeny of all, representing all the groups that we do work with across the, the tree of life. So many insect groups, um, as well as uh, plants. Um, you may be able to see just that the plants are nested in there. And these little circular symbols represent the ones that we've produced, uh, these distribution atlases for uh, since 1962. And some groups, including the vascular plants and the bryophytes, have had repeat atlases. The vascular plants, it's not represented by this diagram because this is a couple of years old, but the vascular plants for Britain and Ireland actually now have three distribution atlases um, covering a period um, of about 100 years. Um, that's uh, allowed us to look at change in these large-scale distributions. Um, so all of this mapping is done at 10 kilometres uh, in order to smooth over historic problems with bias and the lack of fine-scale data collection in the early part of the 20th century. So a lot of this previous work looking at floristic change in the UK has been done at this quite coarse scale of 10 kilometres. Um, I was going to include an example of that, but apparently I accidentally deleted the slide at some point between writing this talk and sending it to Emmanuel. So I'll just refer you to the Plant Atlas 2020 website, uh, which you can Google, which has all of the information about all of the trends for over 3,000 species at this 10 kilometre uh, species distribution level going back to 1930. As I say, that was published both as a, a two-volume book weighing in at eight kilos and a, a comprehensive website. Um, at Plant Atlas 2020. So this is the kind of background to citizen science plant monitoring in the UK. And when I use the term citizen science, in the UK that tradition, historically at least, has really covered amateur naturalists working with professional naturalists in societies like the Botanical Society of Britain and Ireland. So it's people with a strong, excellent and very accurate interest in plants who often are publishing things like taxonomic monographs, uh, and local observations in national journals. So it's, a, it's a maybe a slightly different segment of citizen science into which we, uh, other people may refer sometimes. Um, so that's really the background to the National Plant Monitoring Scheme, which is quite a different beast and perhaps more similar to things that other people are going to speak about today. And the real driver for it was this fact that we had these 10 kilometer level 10 by 10 kilometer square level distribution trends for almost 100 years. Uh, and that showed us certain things like uh, declines and re slight recoveries in arable weeds, arable floras, um, the loss of lowland wetlands in the UK. But it obviously restricted those analyses to that scale. And what we, these conservation agencies, really wanted was more information at the habitat scale, at the plant community scale. Um, focusing in on abundance. And obviously there were precedents for that throughout the Europe and the world, uh, particularly bird monitoring, obviously, butterfly monitoring, small scales, these things that feed into these now EU-level uh, butterfly indicators and other national indicators. So we wanted something for plants that would mirror 
uh, that fine-scale, abundance-focused approach, which has been so successful in other areas. And this government conservation agency um, basically commissioned this report um, over 10 years ago now, saying that you know, establishing this type of robust scheme would vastly improve the UK government's ability um, to report on and respond to the state of the natural environment. So not just looking at these course changes in distribution, but focusing in on these small-scale abundance changes and changes in plant communities. Um, so this led to the design of, of this new scheme, this new citizen science scheme. And I should also say, and Emmanuel referenced this in her introductory talk, that we do also have another structured plant monitoring scheme in the UK, the UK Countryside Survey, which is run by my institute, the UK Centre for College and Hydrology, uh, and goes back to the 1970s. And that is um, a professional-led scheme based on a national probability sample um, that now represents a very long-running time series of plant abundances at small scales. However, when this scheme was set up, the Countryside Survey um, was only surveying every seven to ten years. It, it changed depending on available funding, as everything does. Um, but at that point, um, it was only repeated at quite broad time segments. So one of the drivers for this scheme was to have annual reporting and monitoring for plant abundances and habitat. Um, the other thing, as I think Emmanuel said, was that the UK Countryside Survey, because of this national probability sample that was used, actually, on average, it missed a lot of the nicer semi-natural habitats of conservation importance because the countryside is typically not dominated by those things. So we also wanted uh, an, this monitoring scheme to focus in on those semi-natural habitats that were perhaps of uh, more relevance for certain types of uh, reporting and monitoring and, and for conservation purposes. Um, so just as a, this is kind of an overview slide, really, I'll go into more detail on each of these things. Um, but the key points are that this new scheme is habitat focused. Um, it is still based on, well, the large scale selection unit is a one kilometer grid square and then other things happen within that. Um, the actual recording is plot based at the meter scale, however, and importantly, um, and this does mark a transition between the type of very professional amateur naturalists that we have worked with historically and uh, bringing more people into plant monitoring, we have established these different levels of participation. So the more experienced, more professional amateurs can work at uh, the inventory level where they record everything, but other people can record fewer species focusing in on indicators. Um, and so a lot of effort went into, uh, on the one hand, making sure the statistical design uh, was rigorous and, and based on fundamental principles, but also allowing um, people who were developing their knowledge to, to enter the scheme and to be brought along that journey with us and maybe to progress their skills so that they could progress to the, the top level and, and you know, become kind of uh, very confident botanists. Um, so I just go through the elements of the scheme. I'm, I'm really going to spend this, the rest of the time talking about the design of the scheme um, and focus less on the results, but I will talk about indicators at the end as well. Um, so the, the fundamental design of the scheme is based on these one kilometre squares of the, the, the British grid, uh, which has existed uh, for over 100 years now, um, has these 10 kilometre and then broken down into these one kilometre squares. You can see obviously some uh, countryside mapping behind there. These are predicted land cover categories. But the important thing here is the kind of the process that we erected for people to go through when they arrive at their one kilometre square. And there are two elements to this, really. One is these, uh, these numbered squares, which represent locations where people can set up square plots for certain habitats. Um, and again, this was done on a systematic random basis. So that grid is essentially random relative to the land surface because it's just... Um, uh, around a systematic grid relative to the origin. Um, and the internal lines represent uh, a systematic random way of monitoring linear habitat. So streams, um, hedgerows, and arable field margins are the uh, predominant ones. So people can choose where to select their, their square plots, their habitat plots, and their linear habitat plots by using this systematic random approach. Or at least that's the recommended methodology. I'll, I'll come on to the inevitable deviations from this in, in a moment or two. Um, so we tried to make the process as flexible as possible for people. So we have this fundamental guidance that asks people in their first year to 
choose their one kilometer square from the pool of available squares, then choose the level at which they're going to participate, and more on that later, and then to do this reconnaissance where they establish these plots, which hopefully are then set up for time immemorial and will be re repeated and repeated uh, for as long as we have funding, hopefully forever. Um, and then within their square, um, they, they identify the different habitats that the scheme monitors, either for these, these square plots or for these linear ones. Um, they can also record additional plots, for instance, if access is poor in the square, um, and, and there are some other rules for habitats which are not picked up by those previous methodologies, but I won't go into those. And we just ask them to repeat this twice a year as well. So we only have two surveys of these plots, so one in late spring, early summer, and one in mid or late summer. And then all the data are captured either online or via an app. And then we ask them to do that year after year. Obviously, if they drop out of the scheme, we hope somebody else will pick up the plot. But inevitably, with this kind of design, there will be gaps. And working with citizen scientists, there will be gaps in time series for different plots. And, and they may have systematic biases associated with them. And all of this was based on uh, running field trials with volunteers over a couple of years, um, sending out kind of distributed questionnaires to uh, participants in a previous project which we were building on, um, and a workshop with statisticians and, and ecologists as well. So we tried to combine um, the kind of rigor of the statistical approach with talking to volunteers as much as possible. Um, I'll just briefly say about the selection of the actual one kilometer site. So as I said, we wanted it to be focused in on those important semi-natural habitats. So we actually created a national one kilometer level weighting surface. So it's actually a weighted probability sample that we're using here. And the weights here relate to areas of important semi-natural habitats as estimated by land cover mapping. Um, then we can take this weighted random sample from this surface. But to get from here to here, we also use a stratification at the 100 by 100 kilometer grid level in order to even out um, the random sample, otherwise it would all be clustered up here and round here where the, the high weights are. So there's a, a weighted random surface and then a stratification on top of that. So that was all, I should say the other thing about focusing in on semi-natural habitats and nice parts of the countryside was to increase interest for the volunteers as well because I'm sure some of you have experiences with sending volunteers to improve grassland and intensive arable and it doesn't tend to, to work out that well in the long term. So. One other aspect of that is allowing people to record their habitats at different levels. So if they're less expert or if there's some sort of ecotone or transition or change going on, they can choose to work at one of these broad categories. But within these are nested, these fine scale habitats. So for instance, lowland grass, then we break down into acid, calcareous, damp, and then neutral. Um, and relating to that level of participation is again, at the bottom level, they could choose just to participate at this wildflower level which is a subset of this intermediate level, the indicators, which are sets of indicator species chosen for these fine-scale habitats. I won't go into the process um, of how we chose those indicators, but there was a, um, a whole kind of statistical rigmarole involved in that. Um, so people essentially assign a, their plot to a habitat. If they're working at these two levels, then that indicates which species they're looking for. If they're working at the top level, obviously they record everything, so then they don't refer to these lists. Uh, and that might vary by visit, for instance, if somebody improves their skill level or if the plot moves to a, a new surveyor. So that's an extra dimension of variation there. Um, I'd just say briefly, we produced a lot of resources to support this. This is a species identification guide that covers all of the indicator species. We have this list guide, which lists all the indicators for the different fine scale habitats, showing whether they're positive or negative, cross-referencing to the, the NICE guide. Um, but we've also done a lot of work putting videos on YouTube, there are a lot of habitat identification, species group identification, website use videos on YouTube. So if you go to the National Plant Monitoring Scheme YouTube channel, there must be over 50 videos or so on there now. And so this is the type of data that we get back. This is an example for a square that I used to monitor. So these bits here are showing the actual plots that were erected according to applying these rules to this square. So there's a square plot here in a neutral meadow, another one here um, in a, a churchyard, which is a neutral meadow, one in a stream, or two in a stream, sorry, and an arable field margin. And these linear plots you can see correspond to intersections with that grid. Then on the, the, the forms, obviously we get maps of 
allow people to relocate or relocate it as well as possible. We don't use any permanent markers in this scheme. Uh, and of course, they can submit photos of the plot on the website. Uh, we're using the domain cover scale here, um, which you'll come back to later. And on the front of the form, there are lots of other things about management and grazing and, and such like information. Um, so just a, a brief overview of some of the data we've got back so far. This is just a, a union of all the plots that we've had data back for. So a dot here doesn't mean that we have a full time series um, for any given plot. It just means that it was surveyed at one point in time. Um, and these are summations uh, at the broad habitat level. Um, so I should have said at some point that it started in 2015. Uh, and so we're in our 10th year this year. Uh, unsurprisingly, for British Britain and the, the lay of the land in Britain. The most surveyed groups are the broadleaf woodland. This includes hedges as well, uh, arable field margins, the lowland grassland category here. And because of the upland areas of Wales, Scotland, and things like the New Forest and the West Country, we also have a fair amount of uh, bog and wet heath. And I should, this is not samples. This is just plot locations. So any one of these locations might have multiple samples. And I think we're edging to like something like 3,000 samples now, if memory serves. Um, so obviously with this type of surveying, and I'm sure a lot of you will be expert in this, you know, there are problems with overlooking, either because of phenology, uh, because of expertise, um, because of turnover in surveyors and things like that. Um, so we try and account for that problem of um, surveyors missing plants or um, between their two visits. And obviously, you know, if we just rely on the data that people give us, it might be a naive view of what the true, say, cover or the true occupancy might be. Um, so I've erected a, a fairly complex model to deal with that. And this is all um, done in a Bayesian modeling language. And I'm, again, I'm sure some people here uh, will be expert in this. Um, but basically what we have here, are, this is a classic occupancy model on this side. So as if any of you have ever worked with site occupancy models, you'll recognize this. Um, you've got some estimate of detectability, this truth, true occupancy under here, and then the actual data for detection, non-detection here. On this side, however, we have the, that cover data collected according to the domain scale. So if any of you will have worked with um, frequency abundance scales, you'll know that it's interval censored, so we don't know the true cover value but we just get back these categorical assignments. So here we work with a beta distribution um, uh, where we estimate an underlying beta distribution per year. So, and we, so we assume that's a kind of latent distribution underlying the distribution um, of covers as reported according to the domain scale. And what we do for each year for this mean and variance or precision for this beta distribution of cover, we then combine that with our estimate from the, the presence absence data and basically get a, a mean of some sort of zero inflated cover distribution. And I should say that we, we kind of developed this in 2019, but around the same time, other groups were doing similar things in the States, Catherine Irvine, uh, I know Christian Damgaard, I don't know if he's here today, but he's done a huge amount of work on this uh, and I'm sure he'd recognize this type of framework. Um, so as always, we're building, uh, standing on the shoulders of giants with this type of thing. Uh, so these are just some results from the early years applying that model to different species. And all we can really, uh, I just want to point out here, the different Y scales as well. So like, you know, cover forming grasses, you know, this is up to kind of like 20% within our plots. Um, uh, uh, again, Achille yarrow, Achillea millifolium, rarer species, fragrant orchid here. This is down at like 1% zero inflated cover. And so we have these time series of these um, within each year, uh, an estimate of the, the mean of that zero inflated cover distribution. Uh, and of course, you know, we have this going on now up to 2022. And so just to highlight one thing we've done with those, within any given broad habitat, we've taken the indicator species and uh, combine them, propagating all the uncertainty into these indicators. These are those four best surveyed habitats that I mentioned earlier. And for that reason, we've taken these in the first instance um, for this government indicator, which is um, called Plants of the Wider Countryside. Um, it's one of our government department for the environment and rural affairs indicators. Um, they're called the UK Biodiversity Indicators. You can Google that and find them all. But this one, C7, um, it's the first time that this has been contributed on an annual basis by volunteer effort. We used to do it on quite a broad time scale um, from the countryside survey, but now we can do it on an annual basis using these data. 
Um, so you'll probably all be thinking, okay, but what about all the biases in these data? And that is an absolutely reasonable question. And actually that indicator we've just seen is actually just an experimental indicator because we haven't built in bias corrections yet. I'm talking about spatial biases at the broad scale and how they might change systematically over time. We, we know for a fact that um, there's a strong relationship between population density and whether a square is actually surveyed. So we have that uh, nice probability sample, but they don't necessarily all get, some, all get surveyed. Um, we know that it's systematic and that it underrepresents um, the areas, you probably can't see this, but these are the wetter, boggier areas of the UK, Scotland, Wales, um, other bits. And these are all, the red bit there is all the one kilometer squares. Um, the green and blue bits overlapping are the ones that are actually picked up and surveyed. So there's a, an obvious systematic bias and that might change year by year, uh, particularly the COVID years were very odd in terms of their representativeness. Um, so the type of thing, this doesn't relate to NPMS data, this relates to, this is the last slide, so, yeah, brilliant. Um, so this relates to um, um, that type of atlas data that I started off talking about. This is an example for Coluna vulgaris, uh, um, um, a subshrub of heathland that I'm sure many of you will know. Um, these, these, this black line here is the true change estimate for one kilometer. Now we put that together based on land cover data, uh, combined with the countryside survey, combined with all of the BSBI data. So that's our kind of best guess for any plant. It's probably the best guess we could have for any plant at one kilometer in the UK <coughs> as to how it's changed over time. Um, this one, this green line here is the, the BSBI, the Atlas based sample at one kilometer. Uh, one kilometer data is incredibly biased because it increases over time. Back in the early parts of this time series, a lot of data were just databased at two kilometer or 10 kilometer. Um, so <clears throat> this hides that decline and, and you know, we have no reason to distrust this decline because it's you know, a common species of a lot of habitat, a lot of lowland heathland habitat that's been lost uh, in certain parts of England. And, and so we think this is a pretty good estimate of the true change at one kilometer. And so we probably want to reweight this in some way. And this paper just looked at a lot of, compared a lot of different ways of doing that. I'm sure some of you will be familiar with post stratification uh, or some sort of weighting, sometimes called propensity score weighting um, or inverse probability weighting. Um, but there are a whole load of other methods that are out there in the opinion polling literature. Uh, and we just looked at applying all of those to this one example to see if we could recover the, what we think is the true trend, trend for this species. And you can see, although none of these adjusted trends match the true one exactly, and in fact, the slopes for these adjusted trends, none of them actually overlapped um, 95% although none of their confidence intervals overlap the true slope, but they're all much better than the naive sample based. So really we want to take the outputs from the MPMS uh, and apply one type of um, readjustment, probably post stratification on an annual basis to try and get closer to representing the UK as a whole, which obviously is the implicit aim of those indicators that we presented. Um, so yeah, final slide, you know, we make all the data open both in a, uh, a UK repository, but all the data also go to a node of GBIF. Uh, they're shared with the BSBI, that botanical society as well. Obviously, um, they end up on GBIF because we share them with a node. Uh, and there has been other work using these data to look at various things, but it's still relatively early days in terms of analyzing the data. We have 10 years of data, but it's taken a long time to, to get to grips of all of the various biases and approaches um, and developing the fundamental model for the, for the percentage cover as well. Um, and another thing is that, you know, we also encourage the kind of stories that we get back from surveyors. We have annual newsletters, um, which, you know, people write in and send photos. And I, th I think this is a, a strong aspect of VG Floor that no doubt we hear about as well. Um, we don't have any volunteer meetups currently, but we have a lot of kind of online stuff going on, Facebook groups, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, yeah, I hopefully I haven't overrun too much, but thank you very much for listening. Thank you.